Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, the physicist has um, released another paper. Uh, this continues on from the three days of darkness. Um, I'll just. Um... Morning, it's Chris Potter. Today is September 24th, 2016. Today's presentation the two objects draining the sun of its energy. A physicist's thoughts. Let's begin. I have previously written about the object in the H12 SREM A images and that it fits the profile of a brown dwarf star having CMEs, coronal mass ejections, which are made up of ionized iron. Figure 1 below shows this object, which seems to be parked in front of the baffle on January 23, 2016 and February 9, 2016. Black areas in the image are associated to proton emission, and the white areas are associated to heavy ion emission, in this case, mostly iron ions. The brown dwarf is made mostly up of iron, and therefore its CMEs must also be made up of mainly iron. Notice that there is a cloud and a vertical line somewhere in the middle of both images. Both the cloud and the vertical line are white and therefore must be made up of ionized iron that had been ejected by the brown dwarf. Figure 1. H12 SREM A images provided by Sechi from January 23, 2016 at 1809 UTC and February 9, 2016 at 1609. The object in front of the baffle does not seem to move from that position. Figure 2, H12 SRAM A image as provided by Sechi from August 16, 2016 at 209 UTC, showing ionized iron being ejected from the brown dwarf. Ionized iron cloud moving diagonally upwards. Ionized iron ejected from the brown dwarf. Right? You can see all the white. Ionized iron cloud moving diagonally upwards. So you can see it going like this. Figure 2 above shows the ionized iron being ejected from the brown dwarf. The iron is ejected from both the left and the right baffle side sides of the object. The ionized iron then moves diagonally downwards towards the right and also upwards towards the left. Towards the top of the screen, some of the ionized iron moves vertically downwards and a vertical white line forms in the image as seen in figure 3. This suggests that there is a highly charged object somewhere along this line that attracts the ionized iron. Ionized iron excuse me. Figure 3. H12 SRAMI images as provided by Sechi from September 14th, 15th, 17th, 18th, and 18th of 2016, showing where the ionized iron goes after being ejected from the brown dwarf. The rest of the ionized iron moves toward the top left of the screen, and from there, toward the sun's north pole. It then spreads around the sun. Figure 4 points out where we can see the ionized iron accumulating around the sun. White is always associated to heavy iron emissions, so a white area is an area where ionized iron has accumulated. When enough of this iron accumulates in the sun's atmosphere, fusion reactions stop on the sun's surface and it goes dark. However, the sun seems at times to be able to also eject large amounts of ionized iron, as can be seen from figure 5 below. Here the sun has what can easily be termed as an explosion, and, a large, amount, and large amounts of matter is ejected. Most of the matter appears white, which is associated with heavy iron emission, or ionized iron emission in the SRAM images. 
The black regions are due to the ejection of protons, so the sun also loses protons when it goes through this kind of explosive episode. Figure 6 shows another such explosive episode where, again, the sun ejects large amounts of ionized iron that is accumulated on its surface in its atmosphere due to the, pre due to the presence of the brown dwarf. Figure 4, here on the left, ionized iron making its way towards the sun's north pole. Ionized iron accumulating close to the sun. Figure 4 illustration of how the ionized iron is getting to and accumulating on the sun. This image is the last image in figure 3. This is figure 5. H12 SRIM A images as provided by Sechi from July 18, 2016. At 1317, 1717, 1809, and 2009 UTC. The 1717 and Figure 6, H12 SREM A images as provided by Sechi from July 13, 2016 at 209, 409, 609 UTC. UTC, excuse me. The sun first ejects a large amount of ionized iron at 209. Then it ejects a large amount of protons at 409. And finally, a large cloud of ionized iron is left between the sun and the brown dwarf. Figure 6 also shows that when the sun ejects large amounts of ionized iron, it follows the vertical line in the middle of the image down towards the bottom of the image. This is an indication that there is an object down in that area that is... <clears throat> and just felt like interjecting because there's a lot of talk about the brown dwarf in this particular paper. Um, now, understand uh, from the research we've been doing so far, we've got every reason to believe that there's a brown dwarf star, the one captured in uh, on the horizon in Brazil, um, near the ocean, and the one that was caught um, by the chap in the UK on the motorway as he was looking in the opposite direction of our sun, and you saw this very red uh, kind of um, celestial body with a halo haze around it. That haze is that plasma we were referring to, the ionized one, the iron ionized one. And that's the same <coughs> uh, celestial body this physicist seems to be making reference to. It seems the physicist is stuck on that particular celestial body. Uh, what we understand is um, there's also a proton star, so there's two. And uh, if there was a tear uh, a tertiary one, then the our sun would be in the center of that tier. In other words, the proton star would be number one in terms of uh, um, how strong and powerful it is. Then it'd be our sun and then it'd be this dwarf star. Uh, both the dwarf star um, and the proton star seem to be near our sun. The proton star is almost like uh, that seems to be the center of this uh, um, uh, solar system that's entered our solar system uh, and uh, everything else seems to be orbiting it and that's come along with it which uh, also has this dwarf star accompanying it so just so that we're clear on at least what I believe to be uh, the situation out there uh, uh, with respect to these uh, celestial bodies attracting the ionized iron Whoa, dude. This is getting heavy, man. Okay, now, <clears throat> this is interesting. These images <clears throat> have been surfacing a lot. And you'll see, like, um, uh, there's this sort of a radiation, a plasma, that's been released at the bottom of these objects as well. Since the sun... There you go, you can see it, right? You can see the plasma. What, we're, what we understand, at least this is what the... Um, um, astrophysicists are saying is um, that this is coming from the um, the the poles of this particular celestial body 
and it's spraying out uh, a plasma field in its wake. This one is a very, it's a, a celestial body to be concerned about of uh, the, I guess, uh, the plethora of celestial bodies following this Porton star. This particular one seems to be the dwarf star, uh, the red dwarf star, and um, the one with the plasma ionized field, and that's what's basically causing our skies to get a lot red as well. I potentially think this could, and a lot of hunt other no spares, but you know, it could again be the cause as it goes past. This particular celestial body could be the cause of uh, uh, it, it, it's it can it, potentially. I mean, Allah well, but um, if you look at the ionized um, uh, plasma field it's got and think of that as a tail and as it brushes past our planet, you can very easily see that tail coating our atmosphere. If the ionized tail coats our atmosphere. And potentially that could be the ad dukkan being referred to in the Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. It's just a hypothesis. I'm just putting it out there for consideration. You know, Allahu alam where that smoke will come from. But this could potentially um, be the cause of that. It's able to eject ionized iron in large quantities. It should be able to prevent its surface from being flooded with iron and going dark. It is strange that the sun is actually going dark for about an hour a day for 24 days every 184 days. It cannot be only the presence of the brown dwarf as being the cause for the sun going dark. If that was the case, the sun would not be going dark on a regular cycle. It would just happen now and then. Whenever the ionized iron on its surface got to be too much, a nuclear fusion stopped on the sun's surface. Wow! Figure 7. Object photographed from the Earth's surface, thought to be the planet Nibiru, which orbits the star Nemesis, from a Jeff P. video. I'll put the link below. This planet is a highly charged object, as it is surrounded by plasma and has two plasma tails. This object appears and disappears and also seems to change color. The disappearing and color chain effect is probably due to its undergoing a constantly changing plasma discharge. The only explanation is that there is another highly charged body that is close passing, closely passing by the sun every 184 days. <clears throat> there you go. So I mean that basically hits the uh, nail on the head uh, with reference to what I was just alluding towards, and that is that there's two stars. And both of which are quite significant, and there seems to be two celestial bodies at the very least, if not three, um, uh, but two of which are capable of uh, influencing and affecting our sun and its surface uh, with respect to its energy and draining it. Uh, that would uh, certainly be uh, another a celestial body that has the same composition and is made of the same stuff as our sun, so they would have to be stars. And the drown, a brown dwarf star is exactly that, so is the proton star. Um, uh, and potentially both of them uh, uh, could uh, uh, um, drain uh, the sun of its energy source as they basically whiz close by uh, near its surface. <clears throat> so um, it seems like the physicist is coming onto the same narrative and maybe he's going to point towards the same thing in a second. Brown dwarf has to be in orbit around the sun in order to for it to be in constant view of Stereo A's camera, but this, but, excuse me, but this other object does not have to orbit the sun. It could be that it orbits the central star of the larger star system. That there you go. The central star, the proton star. SubhanAllah. Okay, I th for a second I was thinking that the physicist is probably not singing off the same hymn sheet and that was concerning me because, you know, the moment we start getting conflict, it gets a little difficult and uh, there, there seems to be like, I mean, obviously then it, it kind of upsets the status quo between the researchers because there's, there's people who are, you know, very genuine people who are basically on the ground researching this topic and giving a lot of time and resources into this, you know, uh, they're very dedicated to it. And every time as a, as a conflicting piece of information does come up, although it is a good thing to be honest with you, because it just basically makes the the hypothesis more robust when you find 
um, <coughs> um, a Spanathorn in the works because it's it's just another another uh, data point to surmount. To be honest, and um, uh, right now, if the physicists had said different to what uh, the narrative is within our research circles, then it, it, it would have caused a lot of problems simply because I mean, by virtue of his profession. Um, but he seems to be like uh, 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 alluding towards exactly what uh, we believe to be uh, the case as well. Alhamdulillah. But the sun finds itself a part of it at the moment. Figure 7 shows an object photographed from the Earth's surface, which is a good candidate for the object that would affect the sun to the point that it is not able to eject ionized iron and so goes dark for a period of time. Now this planet, Nibiru, is thought to have a positive and negative plasma tail. Since the sun is an anode, a plasma discharge from Nibiru's negative plasma tail would neutralize the sun for a period of time and stop the sun from being able to eject ionized iron. It is also possible that the negative plasma discharge is able to directly stop the nuclear fusion reactions even if there is no iron on the sun's surface though. But it has to be that the combination of the presence of iron and the negative plasma discharge compounds the sun's energy drain. The fact that the sun goes dark about once every 24 hours suggests that this object has a near 24 hour rotational period. Now you can understand why they need to use launch and deploy uh, a, uh, a solar sun simulator because the last thing they want us to see is the sun going dark in intervals I mean what we will we'll experience and it seems to be clear from Hadith is that the sun will go dark for three days and uh, probably at that point uh, <coughs> the technology that they're using will basically uh, be rendered obsolete uh, uh, through um, there's many uh, variables that could cause that. One of which is the celestial system, uh, as it's basically exiting exiting out of our solar system. It could very easily destroy, drag out, uh, obliterate uh, the technology that's up there, uh, close to our orbiting close to Earth, uh, and um, uh, mimicking, as it were, uh, simulating the sun. So if that doesn't exist. Naturally, we're going to see exactly what's up there, rather than um, <coughs> the uh, uh, what they're simulating. And if the sun is uh, has been drained of its source uh, uh, on the surface, at least, then there's no reason to believe why the hadith of the three days of darkness wouldn't transpire. Then, as it makes its pass close to the sun for a period of 24 days, out of its 184-day orbital period. It discharges negative plasma towards the sun, which causes the sun to go dark about once every 24 hours. In other words, for a period of 24 days, this object is close enough to the sun so that when its plasma tail is in the correct position, i.e. pointing towards the sun, probably for about an hour, every 24 hour period, the sun's surface charge is neutralized. Fusion ceases and it goes dark. Very matter of fact. There you go. <clears throat> so, I mean, uh, again, I just want to uh, point you in the direction of what he just said, the fusion, it ceases to uh, continue and the sun goes dark. And that's probably what will happen eventually for, I mean, this is hourly intervals. Chances are, it seems like it's uh, the, the uptake is increasing and um, uh, uh, it'll be for longer periods. Up until I think um, it, it, it does drain it for quite a while, and the uh, fusion uh, kind of ceases for uh, a, a, a number of days, uh, leading into the hadith, the three days of darkness and lost quantum space. In conclusion, the sun seems to be getting drained of its energy due to the effect of two objects in our solar system that have come into close proximity to it. One is a brown dwarf star that floods the sun with ionized iron. This iron can either accumulate in the sun's core or it is ejected. But to eject the ionized iron, the sun uses up a lot of protons, which are its main fuel source. But to eject the ionized iron, the sun, excuse me, thus the sun is increasing its iron level, which it cannot use as fuel. And it is losing protons, which are its primary fuel source. 
This causes the sun to get dimmer, weaker, and older. On the other hand, the brown dwarf is rejuvenated because it is capturing protons from the sun and is therefore able to restart fusion reactions on its surface and produce light. Secondly, the highly charged object, the planet Nibiru, makes its path close to the sun 184 days and neutralizes the sun's positive charge by flooding it with negative charge from its negative, apla negative plasma tail. This has the effect of producing darkening, the darkening effect as observed by the SDO satellite, which I have written about previously. I'll put the link below. Also, when the sun's positive charge is neutralized in this manner, its electromagnetic field is affected and is progressively weakened through subsequent darkening episodes. Chris Potter. Chris Potter? Chris Potter. A physicist's thoughts.